and um, and just so you know, EarthSpark International is an NGO in the United States, but active mostly in Haiti. And um, that's, that's how she is there. Here's the movie. Enjoy. Hi everyone. My name is Wendy Salasi and I work uh, for Earthsport International in the town of Les Anglais in the south of Haiti. I've been working here for the past three and a half years and it's like really great working uh, in the town with the community and with the people. Uh, so I'm right now I'm uh, at the generation system for uh, the microgrid and I'm going to show you a little bit what we have as equipment. So we recently uh, changed some of the of the power electronics and now we have uh, some solar inverters from SMA. We have five in all. Okay. So everything is installed outside because the system is designed to be able to operate um, outside. So, and then here it's um, a cabinet with our battery inverters and the batteries themselves. So I'm going to show you the batteries. So we have three strings of batteries, uh, lithium ion, and uh, they have been good too, and uh, we haven't had uh, um, any issues of them malfunctioning since we have them, had them installed uh, in June. Um, so next I'm going to show you our backup generator. Because uh, even if we have our batteries and our solar panels to provide electricity, we want to make sure that people are able to enjoy 24-7 electricity, even in times of uh, rain for a whole week. So next to me, this is our backup generator, which is uh, 30 kilowatts only, and but which is plenty to meet the, the town needs. And then uh, next to it, we have our small diesel tank. We haven't been using it a lot in the last three months, um, which is really good, especially given the um, gas problems we're having in the country right now. So this is the generation system in the town of Les Anglais, in the south of Haiti. And uh, here you can see the solar array. Um, we have some monocrystalline panels and also some uh, polycrystalline at the back as well. So in all, we have 360 solar panels, um, giving a total of 93.3 kilowatt peak of solar. Two years ago, we were a victim of the Hurricane Matthew, and uh, we lost only one pole in town, but unfortunately, it was the step up transformer pole um, so here you can see the broken pole and the damaged transformers. And uh, here you can see the new pole and new step of transformers, uh, which are now mid pole. In the past, they were at the top of the pole. So we lowered them uh, to make it more stable, um, hoping that they won't break for the next hurricane. So this has been a lesson learned for us. So as part of uh, the grid development process for grid uh, building, we have to hold community meetings in town to have the town buy-in and community buy-in. So right now we're in the town uh, about 15 minutes from Les Anglais, where we are hoping to build our next microgrid. The arrival of electricity in a town can be very transformative. For instance, on the on your left, you can see that there's a person still working 8 p.m. to the day there. This is only possible because we have light. But down the street, you can see a woman sitting outside and a group of people playing domino. And there are street lights. Customer's house 
and uh, she has two freezers that she normally connects to the system and she's a businesswoman so she sells cold cold drinks and water and you can see some of some of her stock here so here uh, you can see um, it's an electric mill that can be used to process peanut to make peanut butter so um, it's a female group that has been using this equipment and testing it out as part of productive uses of electricity project and then uh, next to it you can see another machine which is called a corny canola that can help remove the grains of uh, the corn kernels from the cob and you can see corn that has already been decanoled So all those are powered from the electricity from the grid. And uh, she has also been uh, testing out some electric cooking equipment, like uh, a small electric stove and an electric oven. Yeah, that's already it. So it's very uncut. Um, um, what you can see, I mean, you, you can really tell this is really where electricity comes for the first time and the, the dramatic change that this offers. And I think that's very often when we talk about this here in Brussels, something we overlook. There's many places where either electricity is not 24 seven or it's not at all, or it's a luxury item. And so it's very transformative in many regards. So it's very impressive the work and also an, an, another very important dimension of the energy transition. So that was our uh, excursion to Haiti. And uh, with that, we're gonna go back, we're gonna cross just north to the United States, still into a warm place, but much drier to Arizona. And we're gonna talk to Steve McLean now. Uh, welcome, Steve. And so we're gonna skip right into the next session. Again, feel free to move around and don't, uh, don't be shy to get up and get more food. It's gonna be out there for a little while longer while we get started here. So Steve, um, you're the CEO of Strategic Microgrid and you have a career background as owner and executive in many sectors, actually not only in the energy sector, but also in finance, construction, manufacturing, and distribution. So it would be almost shorter to mention where you haven't <laughs> run things, but right now you're really active in the field of energy transition, renewable energy, and energy systems with strategic microgrid. Really impressive. Um, Steve, before we go and talk more about your technology and, and your product, basically, uh, just for starters, I mean, you, you offer microgrids. So why should we be talking about microgrid systems? Why are they relevant? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm honored to be here and I've uh, been exposed to a lot. Um, there's a lot of thoughtful comments and a lot of very effective thinking in this in this meeting and I feel very happy to be here um, and be exposed to this um, secondly you were talking about my experience and I think that's probably more a function of old age than anything else so <laughs> but you know to answer your question you know I one of the reasons that I was interested in coming to this is because we focused on the transition that's taking place in the energy space now and what the future looks like um, and our company was put together and founded by people mostly that uh, the majority of their background came from outside the energy business. Um, one of the founders, for example, that's the one who leads the design of our systems and those things came from the blood processing business. He's a mechanical engineer, um, undergrad, and graduate school. He was, uh, went to business school and, and graduated in management, and then he entered the blood processing device business um, and holds about 26 patents on different types of blood processing equipment. So he and the other founder who did come out of the energy industry, they began to look at renewable power generation 
and they stood back you know, from a different perspective and said, what can we do here and what should these systems really do and what should they be capable of? And it really falls into about three categories that have already been discussed today. One of them is integration. How do you integrate these, these kinds of systems or how can you into the community and into the energy business? Uh, secondly, um, how do you make them more efficient? How do you help promote and improve efficiency? And then, and then finally, how do you unlock value? Uh, can there be more value unlocked in these systems besides just producing energy and the offset that is associated with that? And then the other one that emerged that's probably the most important one is what can you do to be able to create and make a greater con contribution to sustainability? So really what it boils down to is that they stood back and they looked at these, these ideas and they began to look at distri distribution systems and distributed generation systems around the country and they found you know, a couple different uh, characteristics were, that were consistent across the board. One of them was that <clears throat> they were essentially single purpose and used to cover or to create a platform to put some solar panels on in the, in the solar business anyway. And that was, that was it, they were restricted to that. They stood back and said, so how can we take that concept and create more value? So one example would be in parking structures. Traditional parking structures were created to cover cars, you know, in parking lots, but just the cars and nothing else. They stood back, looked at it, and the one founder said, why don't we design something that'll create an indoor and outdoor space that will protect all that environment, or a big portion of it, um, and it'll also do things that'll create other value and unlock other value as well. So they designed systems, and some of the systems we build in retail, for example, for, for parking are large structures that cover an acre plus, two acres, it covers the entire area, so it contributes to sustainability because really what's a parking lot, it's two things primarily in the summertime, no matter whether you're in the southwest or somewhere else, but one is a good place to park your car, and secondly, it's a giant heat sink. Um, so, <clears throat> and what happens from that is that lots of things happen, you know, the shade word is used a lot, but that's really kind of more of a looks, sounds like a luxury type word, but really what it is is protection from the ultraviolet rays of the sun and protection from other elements in the winter time and during storms. And so that has lots of value because it, it reduces heat island litigation, it preserves the asphalt, it preserves the automobiles, it makes them safer. And then the other thing that they found after we built a few of these structures and talked to customers was number one, they felt more secure either daytime and nighttime, because it's, instead of making them low to the ground, like eight or nine feet just above the cars, it made them 25 to 30 feet tall. So they, and I, when I interviewed with the company, I went to every system that they built in Phoenix area and I talked to customers and one woman I talked to, and it was early in the morning that day, you know, just about daylight, she said she was a working mother. The only time that she could shop was in the morning usually in low light conditions that she felt more secure under this structure than she did either out in the open or in one that was low that had lots of dark spots. Because these are well lit, there's no dark dark spots in it. So how does all that stuff contribute to, you know, unlock other value? Save the money on the amount of time, the number of times that they have to reseal or refurbish the parking lot because it's better protected. And they compared the life of the parking lot against their other stores that didn't have that. But the biggest thing was it, it increased their sales. More people came to the store from a wider zip code area and shopped there. So when you take those numbers and you run those through the model, in addition to the energy savings, it actually the energy savings actually pale in comparison. So what has happened there is that they took a different approach totally, um, and it's created great value in that standpoint. But from an overall standpoint, if you step back and look at you know the energy industry itself, then one of the things that will make a big difference in this business as it goes forward is more collaboration in my opinion. And uh, to the microgrid part, because you also develop microgrid <coughs> systems and, and um, one question that came up earlier already from Irina about what, what's then special because of course there are multiple companies with microgrid systems and, and, and how far do you see you have a unique selling proposition there? Um, that you can be front runner in the game. Yeah. One of the things about this system 
the way it's been designed, the way it was designed since Edison uh, invented the light bulb, is that the generation resources have typically been large and located in remote locations. And then the power has been transmitted into the load source to distribute it. So distributed generation resources can play a role in helping improve the, the resiliency and the reliability of the system and the grid itself. Uh, especially in situations where there could be catastrophic failures. And over the last five years, the uh, system has become more vulnerable than it was even before that. And that's primarily because of the digitization. Everything's electronic now and everything is connected. So I recently went to a conference in Washington where they cataloged all the effects of a catastrophic failure, which is defined as one that lasts not hours or days, but weeks or months. So if you look at an area like Haiti, that was a catastrophic situation. But what happens then is, you can't pump fuel, you can't treat water, you can't treat sewage because all these systems are electronics now. So if you lose power, then all the distribution goes down. As she said, Sinisi said, she can't get diesel uh, because the, the di distribution system is disrupted. So that's where in the portfolio, distributed generation can play a role. And it w it's not gonna replace all the other generation resources that are already in place, and it won't replace the transmission distribution system, but it will improve resiliency. It'll make people's lives better. Great, so you see it both as something for countries with high income, but also for low income countries. And, um, and in addition to that, you offer the additional benefits of the solar shading, for example. Mm -hmm. um, is that also something that you think is applicable or useful in a European environment from just, I mean, not looking out the window now, but mm -hmm. just in general? Well, as I look out the window <laughs> and walk around Brussels, I see we, we build indoor outdoor gathering areas too. I see lots of opportunity there. There's been a lot of discussion today about building performance. Um, we see lots of opportunity there because our people were the founder and then his the other firm that we have a strategic alliance with, which is a worldwide structural engineering firm and steel fabricator, they stood back and said, how can we improve the performance of a building? And so what they did is they designed a rooftop solar system that's integrated into the column structure of the building. It sits above the roof instead of on it, so it can cover the entire roof surface instead of just the open spaces between the equipment. Then it also shades the roof, shades the building, so it improves the building performance, it increases roof life, the initial studies we've done so far show us that it's possible too that you can reduce the, uh, the load and the size of the HVAC equipment that's mounted in the building as well. So those are examples of where you can do things to improve performance and unlock other value in lots of different applications. We're finding lots of opportunities and one of the misnomers that when I first came to the company, I worked in the energy business prior to this quite a while, but. Um, I was always told, well, don't look in that area because, you know, it's not a hot area, it's not sunny or whatever, so solar doesn't work there. But it's, it's solar works in lots of places because the sun pretty much covers the entire planet. It's just that it's different than others. And the way I, the anecdote that I use for that is that if you take coal power, for example, coal generation, there are areas in the world and in the country where the BTU quality and quantity of the coal is better than it is in others but like the eastern U.S. versus the western U.S. But there are still coal plants that operate in the western U.S. as well as the eastern U.S. And if you look around the world, Germany is a leader in solar, but they have weather similar to this. You know. Exactly, so. exactly. And um, that's a very good point. So solar not just for high insulation places. Now, if you look at your overall outlook into market development for microgrids. Uh, how do you see this in five or 10 years? Where do you see uh, your company or the whole environment moving? Because you said it won't replace all generation. It's not about replacing, about taking away, but still you're hopefully looking at growth. So what do you think, where will this go? I think one of the characteristics of the industry so far is that it has tended to pit different solutions against each other. And we've heard a lot of talk today about unintended consequences for different types of incentives for different, different things, either storage or efficiency measures or different types of generation. 
And I think for the future to be brighter, that needs to change from a policy standpoint. And the energy business is a heavily regulated business, and it is for a reason, because for every modern society to advance, you have to have reliable energy. Um, and when electricity was first developed, that created the industrial revolution, essentially, you know, because it allowed reciprocating machinery to work, and that, that's what kicked it off. And that's what ha needs to happen now is we need to be thinking about this as a portfolio, in my opinion, um, and not trying to be a proponent of one type of method versus the other, but look at it as a portfolio of solutions and then create innovation around that. Excellent. So we can take one question from the audience, definitely. And it can be uh, about either the solar focus or the microgrid focus. Anything? Oh, yes, here we have a question from Shannon. Hi, Steve. Thanks for your contributions today. I was wondering if you could define a microgrid for us. Well, technically, a microgrid is a system that can either can generate and potentially store and also dispatch power under other different conditions. It can be connected to the grid, it can be islanded or disconnected from the grid as well. Um, the term micro is kind of a misnomer because um, that suggests that they're small systems, but they can be um, quite large. And, and the types of systems that we, we develop can range uh, as big as three megawatts if the regulatory environment in that particular area will allow it. Um, so they can be large systems, but the characteristics are they can be they're typically in, in near a load center, like a population center, and they can typically be paired with storage or other forms of generation to provide complete standalone power, or they can be in, in disconnected from the grid or also used as, as support and backup for the grid. Can I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Great. If you, if you do have burning questions, I also want to point out there is a table over there with materials but also videos playing at that table and of course you'll be also answering questions i'll be glad to talk yeah and what we will do now we're going to play a short video and that will also hopefully give some more insights or at least you have a visual impression of what this looks like both for the solar and the microgrid component steve uh don't run too far you also get a little souvenir out of out of the way that's that's very good um i'll try that too just one moment good here we go at strategic microgrid we build microgrid energy systems where no one else can in the center of communities on commercial industrial properties and in military facilities our innovative patented solutions generate more clean, connected power than any other system and deliver it directly to users. They create value far beyond the energy they produce, protecting buildings and equipment, reducing fuel consumption and emissions, and creating comfortable environments. We're in a unique position to serve an emerging market that's massive and growing fast and where the opportunities are almost endless. Already, we have 19 systems up and running with more on the way and we're creating new disruptive designs and technologies. In a world that's hungry for resilient, reliable, and renewable energy, we're building smart microgrid systems that deliver power 24-7, day or night, rain or shine. At Strategic Microgrid, we generate value for our partners and make the world a cleaner, brighter place. Strategic Microgrid, smart energy where the world needs it. To learn more, visit our website, well, thank you. Or talk to Steve in person. A great opportunity here today. Thank you, Steve, for being here. A little bit extra baggage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Coffee was good. Thank you. So we are taking over now. Michael and I. Michael Schneider, please come. Michael, what I learned about you is that you have a passion to build models in support of the sustainable development goals by creating companies, right? Yeah. It's, so uh, please explain to us first, or give us examples about these companies, what you are doing, 
And secondly, later we can speak about how you are doing that. Mm -hmm. Hello, good to be here. And uh, yeah, the, the passionate part, I think, uh, unites all of us. And um, whether we are investors or company builders or just combining in platforms and matchmaking, as we discussed earlier, um, we started very strangely. We said uh, there's so much 6,000, 7,000 billions a year that we need for the SDGs, uh, UNC that uh, numbers. Um, and I came from a place where I managed blended finance structures for PFW, German government, UK, all these governments. The need for the private sector step up was so large and we couldn't find enough well-managed good projects or startups or business models. We were really suffering. I ran the, the German government's Africa fund and we were over $100 million and we couldn't find enough sustainable agricultural projects. Right? So there was so much money and on the other side, we couldn't match it. Um, so I promised to be back with cool investments and that's, that was the beginning of Equinext. So more money around than viable? At the time, yes, in these blended so structures. So this has changed? I think overall it's not enough money, but in these, uh, that it, you're probably all aware of these blended finance structures, often it's a manager's a bit removed from the local market, because that money may come from the European Parliament and the Commission. I, I, my team, we also ran the European Energy Efficiency Fund out of Brussels and Frankfurt. So you have to go to the mayor, you have to inform about LED or street lights or what we just heard, uh, parking lots or maybe wastewater use, uh, the heat for the school building. There's so much preparation for each single transaction that the lead times are large enough if you are in the public sector that SMEs are losing interest because it's so much and then you have to have the European uh, uh, tendering rules and that SME may be too long into the process until the first transaction for LEDs or you know, a, a combined heat and power in a hospital or anything happens. So I understand. There is huge needs for investments for a new energy future. Yeah. There are funds available and you are trying to bridge the two. And we, we felt that we needed more cool you know, business models uh, that would do it. Give us an example, please. So one, one company we set out early was a uh, off-grid. Uh, we heard a lot uh, about it today. Saw a bit of Haiti earlier. Um, a company that combined uh, uh, storage so we felt the off-grid, on-grid is one thing, the micro-grid is another. But to run that diesel off and say, look, this may be your backup, but you don't need it, compare it to the existing energy price locally, the diesel price, the logistics, the uncertainty in you know, getting the diesel from A to B is one thing. But the other thing is it should be cleaner, it should be cheaper. So we set up GRIPS as one of our subsidiaries, it's 78% or so, uh, our shareholding. And we started building energy systems for small SMEs in Zambia that had nothing to do with feed-in, nothing to do with the public sector. Um, I'm you know, consistently impatient. So we have the direct power purchase agreement with these companies called the CNI sector. So and this is an example, in, example. Afri in Africa. Yeah. Yeah. You're also working in Europe? Yes, so another example is storage. So if you look at district heating, uh, that's the, the old uh, uh, DG Energy um, um, fund that, that I ran. We couldn't find enough decarbonization for district heating uh, systems in Europe. One of the largest is Berlin. I think it's 1,800 kilometers of district heating. So we developed a storage to, you know, that could feed into the Vattenfaller owned, and often this is switching. The cities are taking over these systems now, like in Hamburg. So there is this public-private run energy system that's in place. Berlin is a good example. Vattenfall and the city of Berlin, they want to decarbonize, and all they do is they have 18 or 20 uh, uh, heating plants that do nothing but burn carbon. So it's a disaster. So if you want to decarbonize a large multi-million uh, citizen city like Berlin, what you need is storage that is safe. So it needs to be in an inner city. It needs to be not exploding. It needs to be uh, small in footprint. So we developed a storage company it's called Luminion, and that stores all that renewable power that we have in, in Germany that's extra uh, in a steel block, essentially. So the innovation is material. That was fast for me. So you say we need to decarbonize even our central district heating systems, for sure, right. which currently run on coal or gas or right. so. Then you say storage is a key component, but mm -hmm. from storage alone you are not generating energy. Right. So where from does the energy now come, which is supplying the heating system in Berlin? Mm -hmm. So in Berlin you would, t you would use the typical northern European problem of extra, very volatile, renewable, often wind, offshore wind, onshore wind, and solar. So around Berlin, there's lots of onshore wind. 
and there's lots left. So the state of Schleswig-Holstein, for example, northern Germany, they're wasting a year, I think, 400 million euros worth of renewables that can't be used there at night. Due to lack of storage. Just, there's nothing there, can't be transported to southern Germany where Audi, uh, maybe not, not much longer, but makes cars. Um, so all the uh, activity, the economic activity is in the south, and the north has all the extra solar and wind, uh, uh, in this case, wind power. So these transportation problems are an issue. Now you're charging your storage with that extra renewables. In the marketplace, it's almost free currently, right, in the trading sector. But my dream is much more building the actual energy system outside of Berlin or in, in Africa, other markets, where you use it to go power, to heat, back to now any use, heat, cooling, any service, or back to power. And you do that with a steam turbine, it's very simple. Right, so in the Berlin case, to sum that up, you use decarbonization of the heat sector. You do not decarbonize the power sector. This case is district heating, so you need to do what, it's no longer called the energy transition, it should be the heat transition. The heat transition. Right. So like that's, that's one other example. It's a sister company, has nothing to do with the first. Um, and we are sitting on top as a holding, trying to nurture and help and speed up and scale and be a good owner. <laughs> so your expertise is not only in energy, but it is in managing or setting up companies yeah. What is it about? Is it about looking for the right shareholders, getting the capital, making fair contracts? What is it? It's a bit of all. Since we set up these companies ourselves, uh, I heard earlier, um, you know, some people are investors, so they would look at the business model and review it and be professional in a data room and do due diligence. We were there from day one, so we will be held accountable for the idea even, for how to set it up, for where we set it up, what team we hired, what the, oftentimes I'll be the CEO for a while, or I may be on the supervisory board. My colleagues will be doing that. Uh, the beauty of Econext is, is, I think is very, very unique. There's 11 families that are, some of them are very famous, like the German Dutch family holding, like Stephen Brennigmeier, and there's Nathalie Siemens, so there's all these uh, family owners that are my co-shareholders that have nothing in mind but the holding level. And we could decide in a shareholder meeting any time to change something, to create a new company, to create a sister, or another, like for example, in, in, in Zambia, we just created a subsidiary because we needed one there to provide power. Do they all need to make money or can you afford to make something which is at least only break even? Well, if you, if you look at the SDGs, you can't be impact first because you need six to 7,000 billion a year. So what you need to do is hopefully find sustainable business models, and then if one doesn't work fast enough, if one is slower, if one needs more help, then the beauty of diversification comes in. Your company number five may be suffering, maybe slower. You may have, maybe I mismanaged it, but then the sister company is fantastically working faster than expected and builds instead of just in Zambia, something in Ghana. So yes, you're right, there will be some help between them without them knowing. Uh, uh, you wouldn't cross-subsidize, but you can take more time. We are not a fund, we're not a bank, we are a family business. So we can take as much time as we feel comfortable. So offers a new perspective on what a holding is apparently. Right, I mean, they, they're under regulatory, that's why I asked earlier about the regulation. There's so much in Germany that's overregulated. In this case, the European regulation is pretty good. Uh, it allows a non-bank, non-fund uh, mm -hmm. to just say, look, we are an industrial holding. We have, all we do is SDG business models. So you're not treated as a fund or bank. And that's why we don't need a prospectus or an exit or a time limit or you know, fire sales of assets because it says so in the prospectus. So like you, you were saying, if we needed 11 and a half years and the prospectus said 10, that manager's in trouble. You know, we can just take 20, 20 years or 50. You know. Sounds all as a dream, right? But let me ask you, uh, you mentioned the SDGs that goes far beyond energy mm -hmm. transition and climate. Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that the purpose of one of your companies does not only fit to one goal or to two, but that you really incorporate the, the variety of, of SDGs. Right, so take the, take the Ghana example. Um, maybe that's where it's helpful. My previous work for the, for the EIB and for KFW and, and the, the sector, um, the linkages between the SDGs are so great and we just saw it in the, in the Haitian uh, movie. Right? So access to energy will allow access to medication. Mm -hmm. So in this case, SDG three is directly linked to SDG seven one example. The, the person that worked there and had fair labor because it was well lit and he could work at 8 p.m. the tailor that was in the movie, um, that could be SDG 8 linked. 
Yeah. Right, so if, as long as it's a fair job. So you always find job. another or two other SDGs to which you can we relate. Need to, we need to, no, at least they will be there, whether we are there or not. And to forget about the person having fair labor standards, that would be a, a failure in just transition from a political standpoint. So in Ghana, for example, we work with the ILO in Geneva, with the UN, and say, look, uh, I've worked with them many times uh, for, for the governments. So they will come along, they'll sit on the same plane, and we will make sure that the labor standards in this case are complied with. Have you experienced also a type of contradiction that one solution or one mm. company goal is excellent for one purpose, but still a challenge in regards to others? For example, you need certain uh, metals which are rare in order mm. to, to build your storages or so, and how do you deal with such imminent co conflicts or imminent mm. uh, different yeah. uh, perspectives? Uh, I agree, it will always happen so far, we have avoided it, uh, maybe with a bit of luck but also with a bit of foresight. So if you look at the storage, it's not made from some rare earth uh, material where we you know, depend on some dictatorship uh, giving it access to us. Um, in this case, it's steel. And humanity has known steel for a very long time. There's an oversupply overall, but steel can be recycled. So the carbon footprint could be a problem with steel. But since it's 100% recyclable, we have, I think, 60% of steel is used in construction. Let's rather replace the construction steel with wood wooden homes and wooden buildings and use the steel to store energy because we have it, we know the logistics, we know the value chains uh, for many hundreds of years as, as humanity. So we're trying not to use this rare earth or not to go into a technology that has uh, tremendous negative effects on other SDGs, but they're there, absolutely, you're totally right. Uh, maybe there will be that day where we have to decide. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Which questions are in your minds in regards to creating companies for a better world? Please. Yeah, um, yeah. So my name is Reba Carruth from Washington, D.C. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I want to um, follow up on uh, two things. One, uh, you referenced the connection between uh, U.N. standards, in this case for uh, labor, right. uh, as a reference point for, uh, for this, this work that your companies are doing. Um, so I want to I know a little bit more about that. Uh, how can that that process also be expanded mm -hmm. um, for more more um, uh, work in this area? Uh, and the other thing is, in the United States at the moment, um, I don't know if you've been following this, but uh, a lot of the regulations on mining have been uh, removed, like almost overnight. Yeah. And yeah. in Minnesota, um, uh, they found the, one of the largest deposits of copper and nickel under the boundary waters. And the copper uh, is very important for renewable energy. Uh, so I'm glad you brought that point up. Um, I just want to know, going forward, uh, where do you see this need for uh, things like copper and rare earth, um, other minerals, for example, going in terms of trying to meet the need for energy transition and also, you mentioned heat transition, and the fact that maybe with steel, being recyclable, not being really a problem, but this issue of copper becoming more and more focused for this aggressive mining once again that has implications, yeah, for for what we're trying to do in the big picture. Uh, so you could speak to those two points. That, that would be good. Give us more information. Thank you. Very good. So um, thank you so much for the question. I don't want to live in DC these days. Uh, sorry about that. My wife's American, so I'm, I think I'm pretty much uh, uh, on, you know, on, on uh, the latest uh, developments of what that president has done to the EPA and all kinds of other environmental standards or clean air. Uh, used to be the leader. Um, even this allowing a state to follow through with that promise. So um, on that, from a global perspective, the ILO in Geneva invented all these labor standards. Just take SDG 8, 5, the target 5, 6, 7 decent uh, labor standards. They are very concerned these days about the just transition, fair transition, just transition standards. So if we, if we take one of our projects in Ghana, for example, it would be the exact same in the States. In Germany, it's national law, so you can't bypass it anyways. But in the States, it would be an upcoming problem. So the ILO, in our case, would say, here's a red flag. We need, for example, we need the list of birth dates because we need to make sure nobody's a minor working here, right, number one. Overall, that fits into a scheme that the financial world will call the equator principles. Right? But it's not precise enough for somebody like OPIC, for example. Right? So OPIC would require not the equator principle, they would go and 
level further and say what we need to do is the IFC performance standards, the World Bank standards, and there you'll find from indigenous people, cultural heritage, biodiversity, all the precise project by project defined standards, sometimes 300 pages of environmental and health standards from the World Bank defined enough. So that's why I come from on the project level and it's a fantastic standard, there's nothing better. And it's all backed by ILO, by UNEP, by all the people and UN organizations that invented these standards or drove them into the SDGs. Um, so the only issue that you won't find, and that's it's also an American issue, unfortunately, in the SDGs, somebody forgot to link human rights. There's whole <laughs> discussions, and I've been to the DMZ, the German Environmental uh, and Development Ministry, and nobody knows why. It's just, there's no SDG on human rights. It's unbelievable. So that would be the one thing where you need to look across the SDGs. In your mining standards, there's fantastic World Bank uh, help uh, on, on occupational safety and health, OSH, and all kinds of sectors. Sometimes you'll look and there's nothing, but I think that will be very rare. So if you, if you feel to combine financial standards or markets and financing, what we have even done in the past with the German government, we had like a Robin Hood interest rate. Like if the household was doing better due to our agricultural investment, the interest rate would go down. So we linked the incentives in a weird way where we said, look, you're getting a loan, but you need to make sure that household incomes are rising as an impact measure. If that works, we'll give you a rebate on the, discount, on the, on the interest rate. That's our impact work uh, as, a, as a funder, in this case, at German government and UK government. Right, so there could be combinations of these standards with financing, and that's when you really, really have an impact. Does, one, does that answer the question? You, one last question, and I think we take you, and then we, we can take it. You, 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 your turn is soon. Uh, Sorry, she was first. Sorry, I cannot say lady first. No. <laughs> uh, so it's a question related to the technology that you mentioned. Uh, I'm not familiar with it. I understood it's uh, used steel, uh, which is uh, recyclable, like, like you said, but steel is the, it is electro-intensive to produce. Yeah. I was wondering if you have ever heard or in, in, um, take into consideration the power to gas uh, technologies, the fact that you can uh, valorize uh, yeah. excess of renewable electricity through pyroelectrolysis, yeah. and what do you what do you think about this technology? Yeah. No, absolutely. So, so I think in terms of storage, what you have to look at is you have to stabilize the grid. That's your battery. You probably always need it to have the 50 hertz and make sure everything's stable. Then there's the the power to X markets. One of, one of them is ours, but hopefully it will be more. There's people working on ceramics, people working on stones, the molten salt from, from solar thermal. So there's all kinds of materials that can take a lot of heat and store it and sit on it. So, but that will not be able to take you to the next spring from a financial perspective. Our steel cube loses 1% a day, so it wouldn't be a problem. Like after 30 days, it's still 70% of the heat is in there. But financially, you need to cycle a battery or storage works by cycling it, by selling the output, or taking input. So your uh, issue is the last column, the fantastic long-term long storage. And I give you an example from uh, industrial energy efficiency or industrial processes where it's needed. Um, steel is currently produced uh, with a lot of carbon. And the reduction is done by carbon monoxide. And then what comes out is the, you know, the iron uh, and the, the little oxygen goes into the carbon monoxide and becomes essentially, you know, don't shoot me for it, carbon dioxide. What the steel industry has done, the European steel industry and a few others, they have invented a method where hydrogen, the exact output of your power to gas, is used as the reduction material, and what comes out of your steel plant all of a sudden is water, which is fantastic. So first Alpine, for example, in, in Austria, and I spoke with Max about it a few months ago, there's a few steel companies that try to save essentially their industry because they're getting carbon tax, they're getting all kinds of criticism. Not Same with the cement industry, they all need alternatives. So yours would be one, where your little uh, hydrogen uh, is being now used to reduce uh, Fe203, I think it is, into iron. Your iron is produced as much as it was before, but what comes out is no longer carbon dioxide, it's now water. And that could be used for mobility, for, you know, we all know that the German car industry, because of the Chinese focus, is now focusing on these batteries and they are problematic. It could be replaced, what the Japanese makers and Korean makers are also having in their portfolio is the water-based uh, um, or hydrogen-based uh, car models. So I'm excited about that. And we, we, none of us with like some holding company should uh, say, oh, that's the one that we need to do. 
Now, I think all these columns are very important for from immobility to stable grids to long-term storage, and that's yours. The seasonal one is the gas, I think. But it's hydrogen or some other. I think it's probably going to be hydrogen. Super, thank you. An thank expert you. on technologies, on financing, and on company building. And uh, later, go to him and get advice. And your turn is soon. So you there will be more. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. It's a long bag, a long way for your travels. And of course, Michael, <clears throat> Michael has a table over there as well with materials on the various companies. And as you mentioned already, you'll be back on stage later too. So there's more opportunities later. Um, I wanted to encourage you. It's, it's the afternoon. Maybe everybody wants to get up and stretch. You know, you do that in baseball. When is it? Which inning? Seven. Seventh inning. <laughs> so we get up and we stretch. I don't play the music. There's nobody dancing, sorry. But just, just try to wake up for a second. And uh, because we're not done yet. We're not done, but we've, we're in the we're in the uh, last mile to the goal, so we can stretch, and then we go back. And there is also coffee coming. I don't know whether it's already there or it's still coming, but some one or the other. So there will be also relief from caffeine. And um, we go to our next interview. Yes, um, Daniel Valia. I wanted to introduce you, but you can stay off the stage because we show the video first. Uh, probably, I don't know, maybe it's better after. After, yeah, good, then please come and join me on the stage, even better. And um, please take a seat. We have microphones, ample microphones over here for you and for me. And then, of course, we can give people a second to come back. Would you like some water, or are you good with the juice? Good, good. I still have my water here. So, this is maybe a good, good moment. Well, really a good group that left for the coffee. I shouldn't have mentioned that maybe, but okay, sorry, sorry. So they will be awake for the video later. That's, that's true, that's true. So, um, Let's, let's hope they come for the video. And um, anyway, for you who are still in here, which is also a good number, so Daniel Valier is a civil engineer, but also has a very strong interest in environmental protection and resource conservation. And that also links then or leads directly to another field of interest which comes from these two strengths is the interest in sector coupling. And we already heard some mentioning of this earlier today. So it's about connecting fields, not using monodirectional, but using resources efficiently and saving the environment while thinking as an engineer. You also have these two heads basically from the University of Rostock, you're a researcher there but you're also representing here Gikon Grossman um, Consulting, Industrial Consulting, which is behind the innovation you're gonna talk about to us here today. Um, so I won't, I won't say anything about the innovation, this is your role, but I want to say he too has a table over there, it's right uh, on the right behind you. Gikon, you can't miss it. There's ample materials over there. And of course, you too will be able to answer questions later during the day. Right. Um, thank you so much for coming to talk to us here today and uh, for volunteering to also take questions, both from me and later from the audience. So you can already get ready a little bit. Uh, first of all, since you are here representing Gikon, and uh, this uh, innovative offshore foundation technology. Why don't you explain to us or uh, what it is and what makes it so special? How is it different? 
and um, maybe also just to start very with the basics because I don't know how many people here have seen offshore wind turbines in person. So maybe explaining what, what, why the challenge exists, what basically is the need for your product. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Max. Um, I w would not start with the, with the, with the, uh, with the uh, things to do, but with the, with the opportunities. Um, at the moment, um, we have um, more than uh, 20,000 or about 20,000 megawatts uh, of installed uh, capacity um, for uh, offshore wind turbines, uh, mostly in Europe, also some in China. Um, three, I think, in the US. Uh, the first three were installed last year. And um, the question why um, Europe is pushing very fast on that is just um, because the, the opportunities we have here. We have very shallow water conditions uh, in the North Sea, but also in the Baltic Sea. So um, Germany, Denmark, the UK, um, also the Netherlands and Belgium are pushing very, very, um, yeah, uh, pushing on the uh, development of um, um, offshore wind. And uh, uh, only in 2018, more than uh, 10 billion euro were spent uh, on offshore wind. So the market is huge and the opportunities um, to really um, harvest a lot of our um, energy demand uh, uh, in offshore wind where we don't have um, people we are disturbing, where the impact on the environment can also be much less than compared to onshore wind. Um, of course, I, when I'm talking with biologists, I'm always asking about um, migrating birds because these are also um, flying over the Baltic Sea and this is also things we are um, having in mind. Also the influence on, on mammals, on whales um, in the Baltic and in the North Sea. Um, these are things which are tackled, um, but um, con summing up all these um, pros and cons, I think um, offshore wind in general has a great opportunity for driving a low carbon uh, energy, uh, energy generation. I even heard, and maybe you can say more about this, that in some cases uh, the foundations serve like as an artificial reef and there's even more biodiversity after construction, is that true? Yeah, um, that, that's true. It has, um, it, it, it provides shelter for fish and um, a lot of, um, yeah, um, and I'm not a biologist, <laughs> so um, I, I cannot explain how exactly it's worked, but due to um, the, 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 the fluid velocity is, 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 is lowered, so a lot of algae and other things are starting growing um, on, the, on, the on, the, on the substructure in the water, so um, the, the, it's, uh, the biomass is it's, 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 um, it's, um, growing rapidly, and after a few months you will have like 20, 30, 40 centimeters of biomass on the hull of the structure. Um, and also um, the, another benefit is that the fishery industry, the fishermen, they're not allowed to fish in the, inside these um, areas. So that's also something where we always have to discuss with the fishermen. But at the same time, it acts as a, uh, as a shelter where um, the population of fish um, can um, yeah, uh, regrow. Great, great. And then, um, so you already mentioned the substructure. So I said foundation, mm -hmm. when we talk about si yeah, similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so what now is, is it that is the problem? Why you develop this new substructure, this new foundation? Yeah, um, well, it, it's not a problem. It's just the, the opportunity um, that um, at the moment, as I said, the the most driving countries in offshore wind are those with um, have the benefit of shallow water conditions, so maybe 20, 30 meters of water depth um, or even less. And so the, the entire um, North Sea is very shallow, so we have a, up to 50 kilometers out, uh, out of the uh, German um, um, coast, we have still water levels of maybe 20 meters. Um, but for Japan, Norway, or um, the entire um, Pacific coast of the South, Central, or North America, um, we have a very steep declining continental shelf. And there, um, when you go like uh, 500 meters out, 
you have already uh, uh, several hundred meters of water depth. And there you cannot install um, bottom fixed um, um, like mono piles, that is one uh, substruction type. You cannot uh, install them anymore. You could, but it would be uh, very, very, very expensive. So if you want to have a um, um, offshore wind at these um, locations with a reasonable uh, levelized cost of energy, then uh, floating floating substructures are a good opportunity. And and that's what you developed, or your colleagues and you developed. Yeah, yeah. And um, do you want to maybe explain even within floating structures, it's it's again it's special in a way because of the material you mm -hmm. use, right? Yeah. Well. I, I'm glad that, that um, a lot of um, people who are also thinking about resources. I also, we, we, we are, um, have a calculation about the, the impact um, because we designed it uh, in two ways. The substructure, the, the, it will have a gravity anchor made of concrete. We all know concrete has its influences. It has also from sand as a as a as a material, and uh, we are also almost or, or we are about running out of sand at some some regions in the world. And um, but also the substructure itself it can be done made of concrete and of steel, and both of the materials have the benefits and the drawbacks. Um, uh, but both is possible and of course with the material um, topic we, we, we heard already um, these are other topics to be addressed because all like power plants everything have these, these issues um, that's another topic so and if I understand this correctly your product offers very easy assembly in or offshore in the water yeah and compared to what we see traditionally, I mean, when we look at the Baltic Sea or anywhere where we have now wind parks, there's a huge crane boat coming in and there's a lot of, and it can only run when the weather is really nice. And you have a lot of really a construction site offshore. So that's different in your product, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, the, the, the big uh, crane vessels you just mentioned, they cost about more than 200,000 euro a day. And now if you um, imagine having a bad weather uh, and waiting for your weather window and you're waiting like 10 days to have good weather again and you're just uh, dumping one, uh, two, two million euro. And um, so um, the approach from floating wind is a different one because we can assemble the turbine right on top. It is a one step installation. We are um, towing out the entire structure including the, the turbine mounted and um, to the to the location, just um, lowering our gravity foundation. We will see it in the in, in the video, and connecting it to the cable. Of course, the cabling work would be something which has has to be done before. But besides that, it's a much quicker and also um, cost saving approach. Great. Why don't we start the video and then any questions that remain after the video, we can answer them. Yeah. Maybe without the sound, it's a lot, a little bit. It's just, it's just, just, just it's no music. words, right? Yeah, and I yeah. can comment it. That's better good. To, I'll do to, that. To understand. I'll turn off the sound and start the video. Just a second. And um, of course, while we wait for the video, uh, of course, any questions that we cannot answer now in the session. Hopefully you will be able to answer later um, at your table. So I'll start this without sound. So it's, it's usually coming with music, but now with your live comment. Yeah. Okay, um, so when we, we, we started the project, because the development is ongoing since more than 10 years, we said, um, or we found that um, a very decentralized um, production um, for a serial production makes yeah. sense. Just imagine the car industry where Volkswagen or Daimler or other um, companies are just getting their resources and their parts from different prefabrication sites. That's what we are doing here, uh, for example, in, in, in France, and just uh, bringing these elements which are designed to fit on the train and bringing them to the, um, to the harbor, to the port, where we can assemble the structures you can see the, si the, the size 
um, um, compared to the people. We are able to bear a wind turbine um, of six megawatt or higher rated power. Um, we are assembling parts of the structure and um, having here the so-called gravity um, anchor, which has some um, hollow parts inside, which will be um, ballasted later with seawater. We build our structure itself on top. And um, yeah, we are here and one showing one example in the dry dock with a cereal production. Um, then we are um, equipping that with ladders and staircases and so on and towering the, the entire uh, structure out of the, of the dry dock so we can start with the next uh, series um, of five or depending on the dry dock um, um, structures. We are equipping um, the structure with the wind turbine, with the tower and we need only two small tugboats um, to uh, transport it to the installation site. We are ballasting the anchor um, and lowering it and pulling the structure downwards. So um, that's basically the, the installation step, as I said. Um, we are, of course, having to attach the cable, um, but besides that, it's a very efficient way of installation. And uh, as you say, we, uh, before it could act as a shelter because we are um, the, um, the velocities of uh, uh, current and the waves are getting uh, or uh, we are sheltering this area of water. And so um, actually um, marine growth can start there because in water depth with 200 meters, there would be uh, barely any uh, marine growth at the seabed at the bottom because there's no sunlight. Yeah. Well, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. And we have, we have time for one question from the audience. Um, Shannon, you're, you're, you have good reactions. It's like quick. And so watch just very briefly this one question. And then, of course, please go and ask questions directly later at the table. Shannon. Hi, Daniel. I'm Hi. Shannon Rivers. I was wondering if you could talk about if you had any issues with um, shipping lanes or military zones um, in identifying offshore locations. You mentioned the mammals and um, bird migratory paths. Yeah, uh, well, in, in Germany, um, people are really very aware. Also, with the, with the noise emissions, there are um, limitations uh, from the BSH, which is the the. Um, um, yeah, the part of the of the country who is uh, actually regulating these uh, things, and of course there are shipping lanes which where are where it's not possible to install wind turbines. But so the the the, the, the German um, the uh, bay is is um, is uh, divided in in areas where wind turbines can be installed and where not. Uh, also for um, ecological ecological sanctuaries and so on. Um, um, these areas um, are restricted where we are not building it. But besides that, there's still so much, uh, there's a lot of space to install these, um, these turbines. And uh, besides that, especially in the Baltic Sea, we, had of, uh, uh, we have still some issues with the armory from the Second World War because it was just dumped and, and dropped the, 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 the bombs uh, when the, the planes returned to other countries. They were just dumped. Uh, into the ocean, and uh, this is still also an issue when installing these these things, these turbines. So challenges even there. We can, we can't take any questions anymore. Uh, we really over time, but thank you so much for presenting this here, Daniel. Yeah. As a little token of gratitude, something to so read on the travel home. But right. of course, as I said. Uh, please ask Daniel questions later. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, too. Thank you very much. And we hand over right away yeah. to Monica. And we ask Jan to join us here. Jan, you are the lucky one who can be here twice. Actually, three times. I had way too much air time. I just three times, you know, right? <laughs> so, but there is a lot what you have to share with us. Um, Jan had been... Uh, 
presented already earlier, he works for the Regulatory Assistance Project, a non-governmental organization, and you are dedicated to the energy transition. And you have spoken in the first part, and most of you have listened to him. I have read you have been named one of the world's top 25 energy influencers. I'm not asking you now how that came. I ask you, what is your key message? If you are an energy influencer, what is your key message? No, that was, I, I don't even know what metrics they use to assess that. Um, uh, there's a whole bunch of people who you know, receive that uh, uh, categorization. Just be happy um, and, and use it. <laughs> I think, I think um, you know, my main message is that you know, we, we, can, we can do this and we just, we just need to make sure we get clever people together, we create a narrative in society about what this means and how we, how we do it and get the regulations right so you know, the right kinds of behaviors are logical. Um, and right now we're still we're subsidizing behavior that is not logical for the clean energy transition. And that needs to change, and that's what we're working towards. How do we design regulatory frameworks, policies that incentivize companies, individuals, to take the right decisions that are also aligned with the clean energy goals? Jan, let me ask you, if we want, or no, we need to combine the energy transition and the mobility transition. It has been discussed for a while as two types of pillars, and it's getting more and more obvious that this must merge because there is no mobility transition without storage, without uh, both type of developments going hand in hand. What is your opinion on how this marriage of energy transition and mobility transition can happen? I think it's not and just, please explain why it is right. so relevant. I think it's not just uh, mobility, it's probably the same, um, or not just probably, it's the same in, in the heat sector, where we see a convergence of the, the energy vectors so we're gonna use a lot more electricity from renewables, both for um, generating heat, whether that's through electrification or maybe hydrogen at some point. Um, and on the transport side, I think it's pretty clear that certainly for individualized transportation, it's gonna be an electric feature. For heavy duty vehicles, I think that's a different story. You know, let's see what happens with that in aviation. But for cars, I think you know, that battle between different types of technologies has been won by um, electrification. Um, and what does this mean for you know the different sectors and how they converge? I think uh, you know, we actually have a paper on our store which looks at that in, in detail. So how do we make sure we smartly integrate a huge fleet of EVs? You know, is this just a burden on the power system? Will this just drain the resources? Or can we use that as a flexible load to integrate renewables, to deliver grid benefits, to actually lower the cost of energy um, for all consumers? And, and we believe we, you know, that can be done, and there are good examples um, where this has been tried. So how do we incentivize people to charge overnight, for example? How do we get um, the right charging infrastructure in place? All that has um, really important implications for the power system. You know, where do we locate infrastructure? What sort of smartness do we need? What technologies do we need to operate that smartly? Um, so I think there's, there's really interesting space between transportation and the power sector, and it is certainly converging, and has already converged to a large extent in, in, in some countries. Thank you, Jan. Let's just use our time and go to another issue. There's a heavy debate at the moment on CO2 taxes, or, or money to be spent per ton, for example, of CO2, and the CO2 certificates, which is a European scheme. Please explain to our colleagues from the US the differences and share with us the latest debates and developments in regards to CO2 tax in Germany and in the EU, because that seems to be very key. Now, I think the US colleagues are probably well aware of the differences between you know, having a tax, which is a price-based instrument, or having an emissions trading system, which is a quantity-based instrument. And then actually the US was pioneering um, emissions trading with SO2 uh, long before the EU ETS, the European Emissions Trading System, existed. Um, but the key difference is in, in one system, the price is fixed in a tax system, and in the other one, the price is determined by the market forces through a trading mechanism. Uh, I think your question is also yeah, about the effectiveness, the effectiveness of these right. of these instruments, and um, I don't know how many of you have observed what happened in um, the German cabinet last week. I'm sure many of you will have seen the headlines. Um, one of the key headlines was that Germany is going to introduce um, a carbon price um, through a sort of internal emissions trading system for buildings and transport. 
and that price will be 10 euros initially per ton of CO2 and then 35 euros per ton of CO2. How effective will that be? I think most experts will tell you that it's not going to have a, a huge effect. When you actually translate that into how much more expensive will um, petrol, diesel get, how much more will you have to pay for heating? It's a relatively small increase, really. It's just a, a few cents. Um, and the impact on, on then behavior in you know, reducing your consumption or even purchasing an electric vehicle or changing your heating system is even less profound. Um, so I'm highly skeptical that you know, a price signal that small will make a big difference. Um, when you model these things, you can see that once you have 100 euros per ton of carbon, you get, a, you get an impact. But that's, and Karen referred to this earlier, this is actually politically quite difficult because it disproportionately impacts on those on lower incomes. So often I think the political circumstances determine that the carbon price is too low to have any impact. I think what needs to happen is to use the revenues as well, and I referred to this earlier, not just looking at the price signal, but also how we use the revenues. And in combination, I think there could be an effect um, that is more profound. Uh, when you look at the power sector, um, having a carbon price is actually having uh, interesting effects which are not very well known because it increases the clearing price on the wholesale market. It increases the cost of energy for all resources, not just the carbon intensive ones. So when you look at the price to consumers, it's a lot higher per ton than what the carbon price is um, that is being traded. But you were the one to say that you have hope. You said this this morning. So now looking into what all these public debates resulted in, for example, in a country such as Germany, the hope is not that big if they came up with the 10 euros per ton. Well, I, I think I'm not hopeful that the German government right now will make a big change, but I'm, I think there has been a step change in the public debate and in the awareness. I mean, I can't remember in my lifetime, I mean, I'm not that old, but I can't remember the last 20 years uh, when I worked in the environmental um, area that we ever had so much pressure for action. You know, there always were incidents, but I think now we have really a, a movement uh, that's demanding change. And I think politicians will respond to that, maybe not immediately, but I think they will have to, otherwise the next election um, will punish them. At least that's, I think that's what all the polls suggest, right? The Green Party in Germany is now the second strongest party um, never heard about in, in the 90s. Thank you, Jan. So you might have questions to him or comments. I work for the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. I had a, a question linked to uh, a regulation that might be in the pipeline. Um, the um, Commission President-elect Ursula von der Leyen has um, proposed perhaps to develop a carbon border tax for the EU. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that as an instrument. Thank you. I think generally that's not a bad idea necessarily to have that. I think it depends on how you how you would design it, um, and what exactly it would mean. You know, what, what uh, who is obliged to pay that tax? How high is the tax, um, and what incentives does it send? So it really depends on this design. I think as as a principle, it's not a bad idea um, to prevent um, you know products that are being imported for example, that are being um, produced in countries that have very low environmental um, ambitions um, from you know, essentially replacing products um, that are manufactured in, in the European Union, uh, which higher environmental standards. But it really depends on the detail, you know, what exactly it is they're gonna propose. Um, I think the initial idea that was being leaked to cover buildings by the European Emissions Trading System, you know, that's a much more problematic proposition, I believe, but, um, uh, I think a carbon border tax um, makes a bit more sense. Thank you, Jan. One more question, if you are having one. One more, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Tori Vanslyke. I'm a graduate student in sustainable development from Uppsala University in Sweden. And thank you very much for the conference, and thank you, Jan, for your interesting um, comments. And I have a question that ties into your presentation from the morning. When you showed us the graph of primary energy consumption now going up, I'm just curious if your organization, your research has tied or explored this much to kind of a Jevons paradox or rebound effect. And um, I think kind of of the greenwashing, if you will, of renewable energy that we see now within uh, the global north of people thinking, well, you know, all this, this energy comes from um, a, a, wind, a wind generator or solar cells, so I'll leave the lights on longer or I'll drive more because I have a Prius or something like that. So I'm just curious if empirically, 
the research you're doing shows that this might be tied into the increasing per capita uh, energy use. Thank you. Gosh, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> and there's a rich literature on the rebound effect, as you as you probably well know, and um, yeah, it, it shows that there is a rebound effect. Um, it depends on the fuel and the sector, how high it is. Um, but it's not a backfire effect. It's not that you know you consume more energy services because um, yeah the um, energy got cheaper. So you're not going to you know heat your home more than 25 degrees suddenly because it's so much cheaper. There's a, there's a limit. There's a saturation point, and most rebound effect estimates I think are around 10, 30 percent in the so-called developed countries. Um, it's a lot higher when you look at um, your know, poorer countries where access to energy is an issue, you have a lot higher rebound effects. But I don't think rebound effects are necessarily bad. You know, it may mean that people who are underheating their homes, who don't have access to electricity, are suddenly getting access to affordable warmth, to affordable electricity. And that is actually something that we would want as a society, I think, and not something that should, we should try to avoid. Um, but I think you make an interesting point there. Should we actually waste highly valuable renewable resources in inefficient consumption? And I think we clearly shouldn't, and we can't afford that. And I think that's why it's so important to think about this from a systematic perspective and not just think about renewables or energy efficiency separately. Thank you. That was a little bit shorter because he has been here before. That's okay. <laughs> we agreed on that. Thank you very much, Jan. And uh, yeah, talk to him if you have more questions. You also get the book only once, although it's a different book, but uh, there's limits to carrying capacity. Our two next speakers, and this is uh, special, so we have two people coming up. Um, I will um, make room a little bit. It's, it's, it looks heavier than it is. You can, you can adjust it a little bit to your needs. Thank you. So we have two speakers here from the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Brussels, the EU office. Thank you so much, that's very kind. And please help yourselves to some water. I don't have coffee here. Uh, Radostina Primova, Dr. Radostina Primova is head of the Climate and Energy Program at the Heinrich Böll Foundation here in Brussels. And then in the center, Martin Keim, is also head, but head of the European Energy Transition Program, also here at the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Brussels. Maybe we can get a third microphone at some later. We, we have plenty, we have, should have enough. But it also, of course, we can't all talk at the same time, or at least we shouldn't. So let me just jump in media race right away, because you heard we're behind schedule, etc. Um, you hold it in your hands, the energy atlas, and uh, you also have a table over there. And uh, please, everybody, go get it, read it. Very interesting. We go straight to uh, basically the essence of it. So you say 100% renewable energy is possible. Is that correct? Yes. And so uh, what steps then do we have to take to get there? If you just say three things, what should we do basically as the next, we heard a lot of policy movements happening, but what do you actually think is really necessary if our goal is not you know, 50% or 60%, but we want 100% and we want it fast? 2030? Yeah, that's the other thing. By when do you think you can get there? Thank you very much. Yes, in our atlas, basically, which is based on scenario, shows that with the current technology available, the storage possibilities and demand side response mechanisms, the 100% renewable energy scenario is possible and it's just slightly more expensive than the business as usual. And uh, basically, we describe, uh, we try to go when we talk about the energy transition beyond the electricity sector. So, one, uh, it is based on an approach called sector coupling. So we need to look at how we should interlink the different sectors and also electrify uh, also the transport and uh, cooling sector. Uh, the second important thing is how to enhance demand side response mechanisms as uh, one of the biggest issues in uh, many countries is overcapacity, which is blocking this kind of small producers of renewable energy and citizen 
cooperatives uh, due to uh, previously subsidized uh, nuclear and fossil fuels that are blocking the system. Uh, a third important element basically is creating enabling uh, framework uh, that is favoring also this kind of more decentralized energy system. And this is a central element also in our message of the energy atlas, uh, which shows that the energy transition does not only mean switch from fossil to renewables, it also entails uh, system change away from uh, the centralized monopolistic utilities which supplied Europe from the past to a more kind of decentralized energy systems with cities, uh, citizens, prosumers uh, that are actually driving the energy transition. And we have a special chapter on citizen energy where we show uh, how uh, basically the role of uh, the market participant has changed over the years and as the previous speaker from Grenoble mentioned, uh, the study in which uh, basically uh, this kind of citizen uh, energy citizens can uh, satisfy 50% of the energy demands of Europe by 2050. However, if we have the enabling frameworks, they face a lot of legal barriers in different member states, disproportionate tariffs. So we need basically the legal uh, framework in place. So we don't only need smart technologies, smart grids, but also smart politicians. So yeah, smart politicians, but you also said it's going against a lot of uh, incumbent structures, a lot of utilities. Some of them are monopolies, some are just very dominant players. Uh, Martin, what, what can be done to actually overcome these barriers? And, and Karin earlier mentioned France as an example, which is of course very still ingrained, but even in countries with open energy markets, it's still difficult for very small producers. We heard it earlier for the Mieterstrom in Germany that's not quite there yet. What's your take on that? So thank you. Th first of all, thank you, Max, for having us, and, and, and thanks to Egypt Logic. Um, I think part of the solution is um, to have more dialogue, to actually enhance the dialogue, and that is also what we try to do with our energytransition.org, uh, which is a, uh, a blog, an online blog, about the global energy transition. And so what we try to do is to enhance the dialogue by uh, what happens in what country with respect to the global energy transition. So I think uh, it was Karine from, from uh, Grenoble um, who mentioned it before. Um, the role of energy communities is quite small at the time, but it's rising. And um, I think one, one um, recent blog on, on our website was about the, the laws of uh, Ireland and the energy community laws that could enable and enhance the, the, the models over there because um, the, the, the regulation plays a, a, huge part, a huge part in that. I think, and I think um, if we share more about best practices and regulation um, uh, and also actually widen our view, I think this is one of the first steps we should, should uh, engage to. So. Excellent, excellent. So in a way, this is maybe also an important part of, I hope it at least at the EFEX conference can be a part of this process, um, talking opening up, also overcoming silos. Very often we are just in our own world. Very important work you do also at the Heinrich Bell Foundation overall. Uh, very, very interesting to see, to read. Again, please all grab a copy of the Atlas later. Um, I want to be a little bit, not devil's advocate, but asking um, Radicina, like, if we go for all these renewables, and we talked about resources earlier, and uh, Riva mentioned the copper, but there are of course other materials too. Do we just go from one dependency to new dependencies? Or is that a different form of dependency? You know, I mean, when I say from one dependency, I mean from fossil to rare earth minerals to uh, minerals in general and uh, other resources needed for solar and wind infrastructure. How can we get out of that dilemma? Uh, so yeah, we also uh, talk about a lot of these issues, the so-called policy coherence. How can we uh, better integrate the SDGs and all energy policies and uh, particularly how to make external trade agreements uh, more compliant with uh, SDGs, human rights abroad, social standards, higher social standards. So one of the one possibilities, uh, in particularly with regard to the external dimension of uh, energy policy, 
would be to, to have some kind of uh, SDG proof check or uh, strict uh, guidelines uh, requirements that should apply to the imports of raw materials from, from third countries and to also to do an assessment of the whole supply chain issue. So, um, and yeah, to do it in a more sustainable way. So uh, to basically more uh, impact assessments, uh, looking also at the external impacts of EU uh, trade policies and uh, mobility policies on, on third countries. And one thing that comes to my mind is batteries also, as this is also, so that means also increasing the policy coherence of policy. So when we talk about energy, we shouldn't look uh, in our narrow spectrum of energy policies, but also should go beyond to tra trade and development policies and have a better coordination of. Yeah, it's a, it's exactly. a very, yeah. very good yeah. point. Yeah. And also goes in line with what Michael said earlier with looking at multiple SDGs, not just your one single issue you want to look at. And this could be done at, uh, during inter-service consultation at the commission and the new so-called regulatory fitness check yeah. uh, tool that the commission is also trying to, to study the extraterritorial impacts of its policies. And that's a very good link to my next question. I want to ask you, Martin, like, of course we have the resources, but we can also look external impact. What does the energy transition mean in terms of geopolitics and security? Because right now we live in a world where a lot of our conflicts that we see are, are not all of them, but quite a few are linked to oil and gas but what kind of new conflicts are there? How can we actually uh, pre proactively um, mitigate these before they become hot? Yeah. Thank, thanks for that excellent question, because um, one of the directions we also want to go with the, with the blog in, in the future is to precisely ask that question and anticipate what are going to be the sorts of winners and losers of global energy transitions, because of course, uh, regarding the, the demand of, of uh, critical materials, we, we're going to see um, a, a major um, increase of, of these of aluminium, copper. Um, when, it's com when it comes to batteries, e-mobility, uh, it's going to be an issue on, on, uh, on the material side, but also, uh, of course, with the relations between uh, the EU um, internal energy market, the single market, and, of course, the partners that are on the brink of the, of the European um, Union, um, for instance, Russia, Poland, Ukraine. And um, so, of course, we need to kind of anticipate what, in what framework we want to work with them. There's some third country uh, rules within the clean energy package, but um, the question is, in this particular phase of implementation that we're entering right now, uh, are we actually going to, to develop an approach that is holistic, or is it going to be a case-by-case -case approach, like every member state's member state is going to uh, develop their own relations and we, we just kind of mitigate and, 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 and have a, a common and, and, and sound ground on, on, on what kind of strategy we're going to have for that one. So that is a key question, I think. And um, I've, I've been uh, working in a, in a project uh, about the geopolitics of, of, the global, uh, of the global energy transition before that. And um, we've looked into that and I think there's going to be a lot of more uh, interesting stuff, stuff going on. So um, yeah. Yeah, we can already see that, and we had discussions yesterday about energy policy in the Czech Republic, for example, and you can see it's, it's very, very fragmented. We have time for questions from the audience, and um, they, they can be to either one of them, please uh, be specific. You can think about it now. You have the opportunity. Of course, you can also later talk to them at their table or in the reception. Um, and just raise your hand and you'll be given a microphone to uh, ask your question. Please, just brief questions and then brief answers because we have very little time remaining in this, uh, uh, well, it's still the before 3 p.m. session, but we breached it. So Arlene, one, one question and then we have to break already for the next speaker, sorry. Arlene from Brazil. Uh, how much expensive can be 100% uh, renewables? That's a good point. Okay, so um, basically, I will, um, we have an infographic basically that shows us it compares the business as usual scenario with the 100% renewable scenario. It's, it's already in the energy atlas, and basically, it shows that the 
it's slightly more expensive than the business as usual to, to build the 100% renewable energy uh, system. Um, so it is on uh, page 23, you have the price tag for smart, new, uh, for smart Europe. And uh, however, we don't take into consider, we have to take into consideration that there are also non-monetized benefits of the energy trans transition, not taken into consideration uh, here in the costs like health costs, uh, energy security, environmental costs, job creation. So altogether, uh, basically you can see that uh, really, it's unfortunately, uh, yeah, we couldn't, uh, we, um, so the, um, I, I cannot uh, show you the infographics, but really the difference between both scenarios is, is not big. And uh, yeah, but for that we have all other benefits like uh, enhancing our energy security, which is also another topic decreasing the, uh, uh, the import bill, of course the environmental benefits uh, and uh, the creation of more local jobs. Thank you, excellent. And of course, these are scenarios. You can find the documents on the table over there. Please take some and carry them home. You can also find bags at the front if you need a bag to carry more things. I wanna thank both of you for joining us here in this brief discussion. Thank you both. Thank you I, have this, um, I hope you can share this because I think we have okay. one. You can share it. It's the office uh, bag then. Also has an office book in the office bag for you to read in the lunch breaks. Enjoy. And if anybody cares to know, um, we, we, can, we can actually reveal uh, Quick one, the invention of nature about Alexander von Humboldt. So it's not written by him, but it's written by Andrea Wolf. And a uh, little bit transatlantic story too about his discoveries in the new world. Thank you so much. We, we switch right to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. It's a fantastic book. I was just uh, reading it in the last weeks. Yeah. Anne Katharina Weidenbach from the commission. Please join me here. Welcome. Anne, you are lawyer and policy officer at the European Commission DG Energy in the program Clean Energy for All Europeans. So we have heard so much about Europe and its regulations. We are now happy to have you as an expert here to maybe explain us even a little bit further how that works with European energy legislation, how is the relation between the EU and the member states and so on. So one of your particular fields is the European Energy Efficiency Directive. Yes. It would be nice if you told us not only what it is and what the impacts are, but also what potential conflicts or, or issues around such a relatively central top-down directive exist. Yes, thanks a lot. I'm uh, happy to be here and uh, happy to see uh, some of you again. Um, yesterday we met and uh, I tried to uh, present together with a colleague, let's say, the legis legis legislative framework. Um, as Monika said, I'm, I'm working mostly in the Energy Efficiency Directive. And maybe with the link to, to the, the speakers before, um, we tried with the uh, new legislation, especially with the governance regulation, to create a framework to ensure at least coherence uh, within the union. So, um, you said uh, it's a top-down uh, approach with the Energy Efficiency Directive, but it uh, leaves a lot of room to member states to implement it based on sp uh, the specific needs of each member state. But with the, the governance regulation, um, we uh, have um, a direct measure to, to ask member states to cooperate uh, with among member states and uh, to contribute together to the energy efficiency uh, target. And this is where we try to do our best to support member states, uh, what was also asked for uh, with um, sharing of best practices, developing best practices, and this is more or less my daily work to try to find and to share uh, best practices. I apologize if my next question might be naive or if I might be even wrong, but I want to illustrate that. 
Uh, some years ago, we had an intensive debate in Europe on vacuum cleaner. You remember certainly. Is that part of this directive? The regulation that vacuum cleaners should not exceed a certain amount of watt, 600, I think, rather than having 900. Is that part of this directive? Uh, the energy efficiency directive is not product specific. We have regulations okay. uh, like the eco design directive uh, providing a, a benchmark for, for specific products and also the uh, energy labeling regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, these are two separate uh, legal acts. Mm -hmm. But uh, of course, uh, we have in the energy efficiency directive one provision, for example, when uh, public authorities uh, have to buy uh, products for, for their uh, daily business. They are obliged by the Energy Efficiency Directive to um, buy uh, highly energy efficient products only. So there's the link uh, between uh, the, the different... Good. Independent from which directive now exactly. is this. The background of my question is the following. Apparently there was research and people found out that vacuum cleaners are a relevant source of energy consumption in European households. The second type of research was that those which are limited uh, amount of watts, 600 or so, are not worse than those which have much more. There were even uh, publicly celebrated comparisons done. So all seem to be very clear and good and also from a competitive market perspective very wise to regulate that on a European level. However, exactly that type of regulation, you might know the precise terminology better, was used in the debate, in the anti-EU debate, as an example that the EU would over-regulate. And I think even the Brexit debate, it was mentioned. So what I want to ask is, on the one side, it seems so logic that from a European perspective, uh, energy, um, highly energy consuming lifestyle aspects, products or whatever are regulated, but then at the same time, people can say, oh, the EU is intervening in our lives. So how do we deal with such a tension? How do you deal with that? I think um, one week ago, we, we had uh, the Eurobarometer and it showed uh, different results. So uh -huh. maybe this is just a, a very recent development, but uh, from a citizens' feedback, we see that um, they they uh, appreciate the work, they appreciate transparency, and this is also what um, let's say Juncker Commission, and I'm quite sure that this will be uh, will remain uh, that um, citizens um, enabling to make uh, good decisions um, is one of the the key pillars um, in in our uh, daily policy, and I think. Um, it's it's uh, it's not seen as an intervention anymore, uh, but but the chance to to see um, how much money they in consumers spend and to have better uh, decisions when they purchase products. All right, so you feel being backed up by population. Yes. Yes. Super. What are your next plans for the Commission? I mean, what next after this energy efficiency directive? We, uh, I can hardly tell what the new commission will do, but what we saw is uh, the mission letter from the president-elect to uh, the commissioner-designate, um, and we saw, and especially our unit was very happy to see, that energy efficiency is, um, let's say, you have energy efficiency, one paragraph, next paragraph, energy efficiency, and the uh, third again. Um, and uh, so, our focus uh, in our daily life is to implement. Uh, it's uh, necessary and really important to have a vision for 2050, but we have a uh, 2020 is approaching soon, 2030, the targets are, at least from our perspective, for now clear, and we need to ensure uh, implementation. And we do it, uh, for example, in three weeks, uh, we will travel to uh, Zagreb, for example, we have concerted actions. Um, it's organized by member states, and we go there together with colleagues from uh, research institutes um, to to provide um, practical, practical uh, support for member states, like how to monitor and verify savings, uh, what measures to, to set up in, uh, in the transport sector, 
what sectors could be targeted on top, for example, the water sector, um, to how could, for example, the uh, water and energy water energy nexus be addressed. Um, I think there's uh, there are still sectors which need to be um, uh, addressed by policy measures. For example, ICT sector is very important. Uh, also for me, I'm now working on um, not, for example, eco design could provide uh, the um, entry barriers for products or like servers to be on the market. But uh, we would like to help member states to monitor better um, and to improve um, energy efficiency um, uh, of servers after the purchase of a product. So this is what we contribute to do. We go to member states, we, we meet uh, and um, do our best to, to so ensure implementation. Awareness raising, provision of information, making contacts. Yes, and of course it's um, a kind of, uh, we see us as really as the, the policy officers as technical support because they are member states. They are really willing to do their best, but they uh, have only five people working uh, on energy efficiency. They have to provide input to the uh, national climate plans. Uh, they have to run a consultation on local level. Uh, they have to to speak to mayors. They have to. So it's only five. And if it's possible for us to support them, uh, also really in call uh, this person and you could copy this. And, uh, this is, I think, appreciated by member states, at least uh, from the feedback I, I have personally. But we have heard from Jan that efficiency is so key. And then we hear from you that five people are in the commission caring for that. Something seems not, not in a commission, not in a commission. And in we have two units, uh, 40 unit. people 40, okay. uh, working. Good. In your yeah. time. But in, in some member states, uh, yeah. they are. Uh, only five people designated to, to energy efficiency measures. Yeah, there's still a lot to do, apparently. Yes. <laughs> so if you look into the different sectors or, or, or areas, let's say, like drivers or actors, let's say, like that, the population you said you feel being backed up. What about businesses, industries, um, this ec the economic sector in regards to energy transition, which in my eyes is more than energy saving. So how do you feel? Backed up, even pushed? Or is that a limiting factor? Uh, first of all, I, I really believe that we backed up uh, the companies now with the clean energy package. We had uh, targets for 2020, especially for energy efficiency, but with uh, the new targets for 2030, we provided um, investment uh, or security for investment. Uh, the feed back I have is that um, companies already are working uh, on the market for decades, but also startups uh, welcome this new business opportunity. And um, I think it, it, it goes together with, uh, with the backup from citizens. Um, now for, for companies, it's easier to, to reach uh, the, the final consumer. So um, my, my impression is uh, that uh, energy efficiency is realized, uh, recognized as um, a business opportunity and not as a policy intervening uh, revenues. Another but actor, media. How do you feel there, Bert? I have no complaints. It could, uh, I would be happy to, to have really debates on it, to share facts, to um, to, to share studies, for example, that's of course our approach to do our best that all studies we have, all presentations we have uh, that can share and media can, um, can either make up their own thoughts based on these information or um, so we are open, for example, I had a workshop on, on live plans and I also invited um, uh, uh, press officers to, to join. Um, yeah. Good. Now I'll Don't try my lie. next question. Let's see what she says. If the population seems to be more or less behind, the business sector is brought together. Media are fine. Science, I assume, is fine. Is it the member states which are a hindrance for faster action, or where, where, why does not move? Why do we not see more moving and, and developing? I think it's um, the development of a holistic approach from member states' perspective takes takes a while. Maybe some member states started late, I, I don't know, but 
um, but it, it, it takes time and um, uh, for example to, to show uh, to citizens that member states by implementing European law also pay attention to, to social needs uh, is maybe now easier for them because we have in the energy efficiency directive uh, the requirement for member states to, um, to, to alleviate energy poverty uh, and I think this would also show to, to um, the citizens uh, that it's, we tried to design a holistic approach um, and also for member states uh, they need to find their way and we are happy to support them in providing a holistic approach might sound familiar to our guests from the US. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, if, uh, maybe just one example. We, we met with member states um, and uh, tried to, to share best practices for uh, alleviating energy poverty. And they told us from the practical perspective how complicated it is to, to have, um, let's say, the social or family ministry uh, on, the, on the federal level, but also on the local levels, to bring all actors together who have good knowledge about poverty or energy poverty. Um, and, but, but this is um, really one point uh, we, we, we have to uh, realize that um, it takes a time to bring all relevant uh, actors uh, on one specific topic. Thank you, Anne Katharina. Is there an immediate question? I understand that you had opportunities yesterday already, but maybe one, yeah? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to react to a comment on the, uh, on the uh, private sector. Um, we work with a platform called the Corporate Leaders Group Europe, and there are some interesting announcements made at the UNSG Summit for businesses, for example, 87 big companies signing a business ambition for a 1.5 degree pledge in order to be consistent with science. So I think the momentum is building up. There are obstacles, of course, and some businesses are more conservative than others. I think also on your question on member states, uh, there are some particularities um, depending on the member states due to the energy mix, but also on private sector engagement. So national, um, let's say, organizations are or sectors are perhaps more conservative in certain countries that they are in others. Um, and I had a question uh, because you brought up the national energy and climate plans. So following the commission assessment on the draft uh, plans, uh, there seemed to be quite a gap, uh, if I'm not mistaken, on energy efficiency. And the plans need to be um, tabled, the finalized version, quite quickly. What happens if the gap is still there and with your efforts to try to, let's say, push member states to do more, so there's this technical aspect, but what happens if uh, they still fall, sh fall short? Is it more technical assistance? Or are we talking a little bit about sanctions in a certain way? Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. It's, uh, it's true member states have to finalize uh, their plans by the end of this year. Uh, we we have uh, many meetings and discussions to help member states now to increase their ambition. In, in, indeed, it's we we identified a gap regarding the union's target. But um, I guess sanctioning is not not the way we are thinking at the moment. We we uh, don't uh, we, we we do not hope that there will be a gap, a remaining gap. But in case there is, there is a clear obligation um, formulated in the governance regulation, which means we have to take uh, measures on uh, European level. And that's what we are currently working uh, on in a, in a way that we assess what are the best measures uh, that could be at, um, implemented or uh, designed to address this uh, remaining gap, which will hopefully not uh, appear. But in case there is, we, we will see is it uh, how are the effects of, for example, new equity design um, provisions, or are there sectors we, we should uh, target by a directive or regulation? So this is our approach. It's not about sanctioning because we don't save much uh, more energy with with uh, sanctioning. But um, of course, we um, there are legal uh, legal rules, um, but this is not our thinking at the moment. It's more. 
Thank you very much. That Thank was you. a very good end, I think, of that talk. Same book in the same bag, Thank and you, you can uh, use it for energy yeah. efficient shopping or <laughs> anything energy efficient. Thank you so Thank much, you Anne. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Max, I'm wondering if I should negotiate with you on behalf of the participants for a five minutes break. We should. <laughs> Would we you should. agree to that? We're, we're humanists. Okay, after all. then I negotiate sure. on behalf of Max with you that you are back in five minutes. Okay? Yeah. Coffee is still Coffee there. Coffee is still there. And you can oh, stretch and I just said that. <laughs> just continue the talks which you had interrupted earlier. Yes. So five minutes and then we continue. Yes, and Perfect. you can even Perfect. ring the bell. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you.